listeners, you're here for another episode of Nobody Asked Us with Des and Kara, presented by TCS. Welcome, everyone. Uh, fired up. I'm on fumes. <laughs> a little bit of champagne, a little bit of beer, a little bit of coffee. Uh, it's just after the New York City Marathon, the TCS New York City Marathon, and I'm joined by Kara Goucher. We're going to rehash it all right now. Let's go. It does. <laughs> If anyone yeah. knows you or follows you on social, which everyone listening to this probably does, we know you've been in Tokyo for two weeks, mm -hmm. home for like a hot second, mm -hmm. and then into New York. Do you know what day it is? It's TCS New York City Marathon Day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, t I just took a, literally a five-minute nap. I set an alarm for five minutes, and I was like out for that five minutes and I was like, oh, I missed my alarm. And it was, I woke up one minute before it. <laughs> How much coffee so. have you had in the last 48 hours? Um, a fair amount, but I've been sleeping a lot at the wrong times just cause I'm like, I just need to sleep, you know? So, um, that's probably, I don't know if that's good or bad, probably bad for the adjustment period, but good for my health. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that. Well, I'm impressed you're here and you were on time and my computer failed. So I'm on my husband's okay. computer now and you could have slept for 10 more minutes. Literally no one needed to know that. <laughs> you didn't have to out yourself there. <laughs> well, I'm just keeping it honest. I wasn't mad okay. at all. Yeah. I, made I know you weren't mad. You're being super yeah. chill and I love that. Okay. Well, you're leading today. You were, you've been in New York. Mm -hmm. How do we want to get into this? Wow. I mean, I guess just quick hit, uh, women's, I think, and I, I think I saw on the Twitters that you think, former Twitters, most exciting race of the year? Yeah. Marathon, without a doubt. Best marathon I've seen all year for women. And the men, I didn't see a thing. So you're going to have to <laughs> fill in a lot of gaps here. I could hear um, the broadcast, which was entertaining, and it sounded like there was a big breakaway, but we'll, we'll dig into it and see what happened there. Um, I think I mean, do you want to go through like the pre-race stuff, like yeah. what the athletes said, what the agents said, and then yeah. get into what actually happened? Because, you know, it's usually lies. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, oh, press yeah, conference, I, wanna... I learned this, I learned you that. You know all and, the background like, information. Yeah. So talk to us about before, what you heard from athletes, who you thought was ready to go, um, and maybe was selling it. Yeah. I mean, what I, I thought was a bummer, but also very genuine and honest was Perez Jeptichir. Um, so the scuttlebutt was that they were like, you know, she came in a little dinged up and they were like, Hey, just, just go get physio to hit pause on things. Don't overthink this. Um, we'll make a decision when we have to make a decision. And she was like, okay. And that was like, you know, in the, the 15 minutes before the press conference, they're like, just, we're going to get a physio and like, this is the best guy in the world. He's going to work on you. So like, just, you don't have to lie, but you don't have to say that things are, are not going great. And she was like, cool, got it. And then. Um, she went to the press conference and she said, I think I'm, I'm going to drop out. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to start. Like it was like the first thing out of her mouth and everyone was like, no. Um, yeah. But I, I actually appreciate the honesty there because usually what you get at the press conference is like, oh, went great. Fittest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm going to go and win the race. And then you yep. know, mile three, they're on the side of the road. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, yeah, I had this massive injury. Um, totally. So I saw that headline and I was like, oh, she's definitely not going to start because it was like – yeah. You know, I've been battling an injury. I might not start. And I'm like, no one's starting New York in that sort of situation, especially someone like her who is the Olympic champion, so much pressure. Like, she's not going to go out there and just jog three miles just to, right? I was like, she's off the list. She's not going to start. Right. I think that was the best thing for her situation, particularly given they're going to be picking Olympic teams soon. So, like, all the results matter. Um it's a bummer of a situation to be in, but if you get a if you have a DNF on the resume and they're picking the team and that's the most recent thing, it's like, oh well, not reliable. Or you know, there's just a, a reason for pause. Um, a DNS is is a bummer, but it doesn't kind of hit the resume as much as a DNF, in my opinion. So selection totally. committee is like, well, if she's still you know defending champ, um, we should put her. You know, there's arguments for her still, but if she goes and starts, drops out, or starts, gets hurt, um, then you lose a little bit of leverage there, I would think. Yeah, for sure. What else did you find interesting at the press conference, storyline-wise? 
Um, to, I'm going to be totally honest. I did not go to the press conference. So I, I did all the research okay. afterwards. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was kind of the women's front of the field was just going to be so fascinating. And, and Carrie Tullifson, who did the broadcast for ESPN and I were talking about it last night and it was like, well, how do you, like, how do you think this is going to play out? Like you have, uh, Gade, who's like a two sixteen woman in her debut, fastest debut ever, but she's only run Valencia. Like Valencia is not New York. She's only had Pacers. That's different than New York. Um, and then obviously Obiri, you know, they were saying she's in two eleven shape. I had heard earlier in the summer, like around September, it was like two twelve to two fourteen. So you're like, oh, like she started out in incredible shape, and then she got even better. Um, and she's run New York and Boston, so she knows how to run on these courses. She knows how to race. Uh, doesn't need the pace or the whole thing. And and then I just I kept going back to that um, Eugene World Championship race, which you called um, in that that finishing straight. And I wondered if Obiri could out sprint Gede. And there is the twenty miles prior. Obviously, that's a huge thing. But um, I mean, we'll get into the race. I, I just thought maybe this would swing Gede's way way given the tactics. Um, so yeah, that was fascinating. One of my favorite parts of the broadcast, which we'll get to, is when they asked you while you were live, if it came down to a sprinter's race, does it apply? And we've talked about that on on the pod. So it was, I yeah. was like giggling. I was like, oh, she's getting asked the million dollar question on live TV. <laughs> you know this answer. <laughs> yeah, but it was all up in the air because they ran. I mean, there was like six minute miles in there and you're like, none of these people should be in the group. Like they're, ha- they're in their mind. They're like having the race of their life. This is like building confidence with every mile that they hang on to the group at 558 um, pace. And so, yeah, it changed things dramatically in terms well, of- Well, maybe this, we should just dive point. into the women's race. Yeah, you I think, think that's probably what we should do. <laughs> okay. So if from like, I wasn't there. I was watching on the app and on TV, which by the way, the uninter- uninterrupted streaming app um, on the TCF, TCS app, like it was actually awesome. Like you could just watch the whole women's, like everything unfolding, no commercials, no going to the men, no events to the men, but I was more focused on the women. (laughs) Um, It was just like really cool and it was free, right? Like you can just watch it. So it, for me, I will say the start, I was like, wow, what a small field. It just felt Mm -hmm. really small and compact, but everyone that was in there was a serious player. But did you get that impression at all? I was like, wow, this is a tiny field. Yeah. I mean, you think about like the people who aren't, if you're not a sub 225 person or Molly's 226, I mean, you have to be in a sub 230. And if you're not there, like you're, the gun's going off and you're running 26.2 miles alone. Mm -hmm. And I talked to um, Kellen's coach beforehand and she's like, she's going to mix it up. Like I was like, she's going to, is she going to be in the front group? Like, what is she going to do with this small field? She's like, she's going to mix it up unless it's absurd. And she just thinks that she should back out um, and run around her her own race. But it's like one of those days where you take the risk because like to run that far alone is just, that's hard. That's a really hard thing to do. So you notice that right away with like, like 14 people in the field. Yeah. What did you think? How was the weather since you were there? It was perfect. No complaints from me. I wasn't yeah. in the back of a car, though. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. I'll be but curious you were cold to see. And it wasn't super no. windy that, that you no, saw. No, like you could see the flags on the, or like the tape, like the barrier tape on the side. And it was just still um, occasionally you'd see, you know, leaves kind of like rolling on the road. But it, it was pretty mild. It was one of those, like, it was one of those days where you're like, oh, they're going to go and try to rip because this is perfect out. And, um, you know, even with Kellen going to the front early, it's like she she wants to go and have a day and get a time on the board that she's like, yeah, like I, I'm competitive up front. Um, but it, it was also very cool to see the watch not matter at a certain point. Like I think yeah, Molly and Kellen almost got frustrated. Like I'm not going to do all the work here. I'm just going to try to compete then. It's like great. More people yeah. just like locking in competing. So I thought that was interesting. It seemed, you know, Molly and Kellen don't have the Olympic standards. So they were trying to keep it what we call keeping it honest. But like the the women were not buying in. They were like, whatever, you guys do what you want to do. 
the marathon has changed so much, and particularly that group of women. It was like, we're going to start racing at 7 or 8K to go. So you guys go do your thing. Oh, that's cute. We're going to stay back here. And so they were found themselves in this really difficult position, I thought, of like, okay, do I just go and hammer 227 pace and know that I'm going to be alone? Or do I – like I felt like they had to make a decision of do I want to run this specific time or do I want to just stay back and see if I can – you know, be in the mix when it gets hot. And so I felt like I could see them fighting that the whole way. What was your impression of Molly Huddle and Kellen Taylor and and just the situation they were in? Yeah, it was exactly the same. And I think you could um, tell early on it was Kellen. And then you could see, you could almost see the frustration point where leading, it's not like people always talk about drafting and stuff. You're like, well, this is minor wind. This is not going to be a huge deal. It's like it's between the ears. And you could see the point where it became frustration for her, particularly with the water bottle stops. It's like they surge, they come back, they surge, they come back. Um, And she was, you could see Kellen just be like, well, I'm just going to conserve energy and tuck in if no one's going to kind of chip in here. And then Molly would go to the front. And I said this afterwards um, to, to Josh Cox, Kellen's agent. I was like, it was almost like they needed to have the conversation and be like, hey, you take a mile, I'll take a mile, or you go two, I'll go two. Because if someone did, like, it was sort of a half-assed effort. Like, I'm going to be out front, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to run 543. Like, that does neither thing. So, like, if they wanted to go and and run 528s or 530s, like, you kind of need some help just because it's a long way out. So if they had worked together or talked about it, and maybe they did and it just didn't make sense, but I would have loved to see that where it's like, okay, you take two miles, you take two miles, and we're just going to make it happen. And whatever happens behind us, is, it's fine. But even that pace was never going to be enough to do damage to the field that was there at the end, right, in my opinion. No, I totally agree. I felt like watching the women's race, it was like, it's in that we're, I mean, of course, we just came from Chicago and London before that where everyone was hammering and trying to run fast. But I feel like on these more tactical efforts, we're in this new era where I don't know if it's shoe tech. I don't know if it's just women coming from the track that have such good accolade, accolades on the track, but they're like, I'm not going to do anything until I have to. And I don't have to right now. So I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to wait. And I know that you know, with four or five miles to go, it's going to get gritty and I'm just going to wait until then. And it's, that's tough when you're in Kellen or Molly's position, when you're, you're still wanting to run a certain time, you know, it's like, you have to make that choice kind of in the moment of like, okay, just like you were saying, it's too bad they hadn't like worked together. Cause I feel like they could have kept themselves on the Olympic pace. What is the Olympic qualifying pace? It's like 227, 30 or something like that. I think it's 226, 40. Okay. And then there's a 229, maybe 30. I don't know. There's okay. like an A and a B. There's there's so much to it's that. It's so confusing. That I Whatever. I should know that. I don't. <laughs> it's, but it seemed like they were definitely fit enough to run those times, right? But it was like just what you said, doing it by yourself, it's just so hard. And so I felt like they would kind of do it and hope that everyone would be like, oh, okay, yeah, let's go. But everyone else is like, eh, I'm good. I'm waiting. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I'm doing, especially Obiri, who made her debut there last year and went too early last year. Um, like the patience that she showed was incredible to me. I have to say, like, she was like chomping at the bit. Like, when are we going to go? When are we going to go? But then she just kept waiting, waiting, waiting. And to do that, it reminds me a little bit about you, although you guys had different race strategies. Yours was like the last 10K, you were just going to lay it out there. And hers was more like, when I see someone go to the arms, I'm going to kick. <laughs> but still to have that confidence to hold yourself back, to really trust your training, trust your coaches, you know, like shout out to Dathan Ritzenheim, like she was just waiting. And she, But you have to have so much confidence to do that, right? There's so many thoughts going through your mind of like, well, should I just go right now? Should I just finish it off now? So. Yeah, she wasn't biting. She was, and, and Gade was not biting at all. <laughs> she was just like, la da da. You guys do what you're gonna do, and when I decide yeah. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run. Yeah, I, I mean, I texted Carrie Tolleson at one point. I'm like, she looks bored. Like she looks, <laughs> she just, did look bored. She looked like she was chopping her stride, just trying to not like fall asleep. Like this is kind of uncomfortable because it's so slow. But she, she wasn't gonna see the front until you know she could see the finish line. And I think that was her game plan from the beginning. But yeah, she, I mean, she's a beautiful runner. It's, it's, it's Mm -hmm. almost unfair. And, um, she, she, I mean, this is her second marathon 
she goes out in world record pace in her debut and fades to 216, right? So like now put her in a race where she's running 230 pace and sitting on the back. Like, yeah, she's bored and she's chopping her stride. So it, it, it makes sense. Um, yeah. And you know, if there's ever been a, if there's ever been like not even a criticism, but just something that people talk about with her, it's that she is super good. I'm surprised she ran New York. But perhaps it was prepped to do a tactical effort because you put a pacer in front of her and she just goes and goes and goes and goes. That's how she got her 5K world record. That's how she got her 10K world record. Um, And I was surprised last year. I will say I was shocked when she won world champs last year because that's the one ding against her is that she doesn't have this crazy phenomenal kick. And so last year in Eugene, when it was her versus Obiri, I mean, she just went to the well, but you saw it. Like she got... Mm -hmm. As ugly as <laughs> she can get, get she gritty. really is nothing <laughs> ugly about her. Um, she got gritty. Yeah, she was like gritting her teeth and like not going to be denied. And I d- felt like we'd never got I, – we never saw that point today. Like she waited and waited and waited and she knew Obiri was going to go. And when Obiri went, she tried to respond and she just kind of couldn't. But we didn't see her get ugly. You know what I mean? I totally agree. I was like waiting for that moment where you're like, you know, I'm going to see snot bubbles coming out the nose or like at least a grimace. Um, (laughs) And she still looked just as beautiful running. It was just like she just didn't cover the move. And I mean, you got to think if it went four more miles or, you know, she could have done that for so much longer. It was just like, which is weird for a track person, but it was like she didn't want to find that next gear because it was was tough. Um, But I think that. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I just no. I thought it was fascinating. I thought she would get to that gritty point where you see her dig deep, and I never really saw that. Do you think that um, she should have gone? She should have gone with like three miles to go. I think she could have, like, just based on. And here's the thing, too. Like, everyone in the field that's in there, they look so smooth. And then you start to see the the tells, right? Like, oh, like someone's head dips to the right or, you know, someone's starting to roll their shoulders a little bit more. Um, never saw that from Gade, which maybe she just doesn't have one. Like, you know, mm. that's that could be it. And then I, w- I wanted to get this on the broadcast, but it's like Obiri at, at mile two, her – shoulders are rolling her head's dipping side to side she's wiping her nose she's her arms are pumping pretty wildly she always looks like she's right at the threshold so she Mm -hmm. doesn't have a tell in that she always looks like she's just all out so i don't know if like if you're gauging that while you're in the race like oh well you know i'm at mile 17 and obiri just looks like she's hanging on so she's probably done in the next couple um, and, and maybe Gade just doesn't have one where she just holds together really well. And even though she's gritting, it's just something we can't see. Um, yeah. so I just, I thought that was fascinating with both of them. And they are such stark contrasts, right? I mean, it's yeah. wild. Like Gade is just so composed and Obiri is someone was like texted at me, like, is Obiri throwing elbows? And I'm like, no, <laughs> go yeah. like get some history. She's a multi-time <laughs> world champion. She's always run like that. That's just how she right. runs, you know? Um, but they just couldn't be more different in the amount of like, at at least what it looks like physically energy expenditure, right? It looks like Gide is just saving, saving, saving. Obiri is just risking, 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 but yet you just like, just as you said, you, it's not, there is no real tell. Like you don't know. Yeah. And, um, I guess we should mention Loketti who had a a great race as well. Another podium finish. She was someone she never. She was just like those two, so patient. Like it was the people who didn't ever get mentioned early, mm-hmm. you know. And that's always the thing is they're so patient. They're just sitting back, and it's this. It's become a sit and kick race. And she didn't have quite as big a kick as the other two, but she, you know, she covered a lot of moves and um, beat Kazguy, who you know, former world record holder, looked pretty good today. Her first time she on did. A, a tough course, I believe. Um, so that was that was fun to see how it translates. And she's coming off of a little bit of time, not time off, but she's been dinged up and hasn't had a real great performance in a while in the marathon. And she she was like at the Yo-Yo Champion Award where they kept <laughs> looking like they were dropped her and then she'd like work her yeah. way back and then they drop her and then she'd like work her way back. I was like, damn, she like wants this, you know? Right. She was not giving in easily. Yeah, she, she got the Grit Award for sure or the Yo-Yo so, Champion. I liked that. 
Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> but like, I just feel like, well, first of all, I think we both agreed it was such a cool marathon to watch because time was off the table. Finally, people just stopped talking about it. Oh, they're running slow. Like, they weren't running slow, but you know what I mean? Like, they were running very composed for them. Um, and then it just became about a race. And I thought that was so exciting. That's why I say this is by far the best marathon I've watched all year of 2023 and maybe even the best race. It's tough between that men's 1500 and Budapest, mm-hmm. but um, this might have been it just because there were so many people and, and like we couldn't tell. And but it's also like a very scary way to race a marathon, right? Because you're like, you know, it's coming. So you're trying to be patient, but you know, you have like four miles of just absolute hell that are coming <laughs> for you. Like what? But you're still racing. How do you mentally do that when you just know, you know, the race is going to change in a moment and it's going to be all of a sudden, literally like what they asked you on the broadcast, it is going to become a track race. Yeah. I mean, I don't fault Kellen at all for how she raced. I thought she raced really smart. Like she needed to be at the front. If anything, she needed to have a little bit of help and and be able to push it more throughout to limit the gap in those last couple of miles, which sounds crazy. It's like, oh, they gapped her by, you know, X minutes over the last four to five miles. Um, but that every mile that ticked away, that was a little bit on the slower side. And I use air quotes there, like, you know, five over 550. Um, that just meant it was going to be faster the last couple of miles. And so mm-hmm. it was always coming. And I think, you know, even you know, the, the first 20 or transportation at that point, like just get to 20 as comfortably as possible. And that's when the race starts. And then she was like, okay, it's 20. The race has started. Let's go back to the beginning of my race plan. I need to be the aggressor. And that's mm. exactly like what I would have done too. I would have probably pushed as much as I could in the middle and been dropped way earlier by just beating myself up. But, um, you know, I, those last couple miles being 518, 508. And then I stopped even looking cause I was like, I'm just going to watch. Um, I think the last mile was 452. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, and then it, that's a tough mile. It's like this gradual uphill and you're, yeah. you know, she's in a sprint finish and yeah, I mean, I, you know, I would have been on my own just like doing my own thing watching. <laughs> Yeah. It's It's just such a tough position to be in, right? Like when it goes totally tactical like that. And and that, I mean, I really like that because I feel like it's so exciting to watch and it's anybody's game. And that's why I tend to like the Olympic marathon or the trials, you know, when there isn't a pacemaker and, and there's nothing wrong with going for time. Look, there's obviously a time and a place for it. One of my favorite races this year was when Inga Britson and Nagus were trying to break the men's mile world record. It was so Mm -hmm. exciting. So there's definitely a place for that. But what I love so much today is you just saw women reading each other, responding to each other. I don't, you know, they were like playing poker. I don't believe that move, Kellen Taylor. I'm not going with you like, (laughs) or this or that. Right. And it's just fascinating. It's like there there was five miles to go and there were still eight women. And I'm like, this is awesome. And not, not that the men's race was bad, but like sometimes when you see people chasing times, it's just a blowout. Right. So it's still super impressive, but it has a different feel to it. But yeah, I was like, oh, Des, Des is calling such an exciting race. And you did such a good job today. Thank you. It was I gotta fun. Tell you, when you told me <laughs> you were going to be on the motor car, I, I had flashbacks to my debut marathon, which was in New York. And Julie oh. Henner was like really on a motorcycle. And I couldn't hear what she was saying, but she was just like shouting because she was shouting over the, <laughs> the crowd on the motorcycle and the press car and everything. And to give her credit, um, I, when I watched the coverage later, my favorite line anyone's ever said about me was Julie Henner on that motorbike, just yelling as loud as she could, saying that I looked comfortable and that I was born to do it. It was like my favorite line anyone's ever said about awesome. me. But yeah. that's what I was imagining was you having to just like scream over all <laughs> that <things. laughs> voice. No. Dad, like, see you. And um, you were able to have like back and forth interaction. Like sometimes with the motor car, it's just like, you get asked one question then it's done. Like they're like, okay, we got that hit. We're moving on, but you're actually able to have conversation. But, um, I'm taking this off topic, but you did such a good job. Would you still consider coming back and doing more broadcasting? Yeah, I think so. I, I actually really like the marathons. I feel like you have time to like gather your thoughts so you can take a breath, you can redirect. Um, so I think, and I just prefer like the distance because I understand it quite well. Um, so I, I would love to do more marathons. Um, the moto was fun cause it was like really light lifting, like, you know, Carrie and John in the booth or in, in, um, Juan Luis, I think it's Barrios. Barrios. Is that who it was? 
Yeah. Um, so. so they're, <laughs> I mean, they're studying everything. They have four races, they have all these competitors. Um, and, and I just sit there and talk about what I see, you know, I can give background information cause I just know these athletes, um, have raced against some of them. And then it's like, well, this is what I see. So there's not a lot of studying involved, which was really good this weekend. <laughs> it was not a lot of time yeah, but, for studying, not a lot of energy still, for studying. <laughs> you don't have to study, but you have to know it, right? And that's what was so cool about when they brought you in is like your analysis was so spot on and so clean and and you immediately got into their heads. And I also have to shout out Galen Rupp, who I know we, if you've read my book, we have our differences, <laughs> but um, he did a great job for the men as well. I was really impressed. Both of you did such a good job. And it was, for me, it was cool to see a broadcast do that and really mm -hmm. do it well, right? Yeah. Like you, you didn't get like a 20 second hit where you're shouting as loud as you can. You guys actually had to have, got to have conversation and the, yeah. I thought it was great. I thought it was they a really did good, good. broadcast. I, I think, um, I mean, and, and we talked to, like briefly afterwards, you do like the immediate recap or whatever with Carrie and, and John. And it's like, I'm just going to be in the producer's ear more. Like if I'm back, like, hey, put me on. Hey, I would love to chime in here. Hey, you should come back to me here. And just push the story, push the story. It's like the production meeting, except like real time. You're like, no, this is happening. You need to come over here. No, this is happening. I want to I want to say my my piece. Um, I mean, obviously with the motos and New York City, it's dropping signal all the time and that gets tough. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, when you have folks who've run the courses and run races and you can offer that experience, it's like, that's the stuff that can get people excited about racing. Cause I'm like, Oh, I kind of can understand what it feels like to be in that moment. Which yeah. Well, you crushed it. You absolutely you. nailed it. <laughs> Do um, no, you, I was like, you were such a pro and that you weren't nervous and you weren't stuttering. I mean, it was great. I thought you and Galen, it was awesome. I thought it added a lot to the broadcast. And so. Good job. I'm going to give you a feedback email. Please send the feedback so that I can get another <laughs> job. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. After seeing that, do you think O'Beary – so if our listeners don't know, Helen O'Beary has won multiple world titles at 5,000 meters um, and multiple Olympic silver medals mm -hmm. at 5,000 meters. And she moved to the, the 10,000. She focused only on the 10,000 in Eugene World Champs last year. and um, she was denied by Gaudet, who was second to her today. So basically what I'm saying is she has won everything. She's won World Cross Country. The one thing she hasn't won is an Olympic gold medal. Do you think she's finally going to get it in Paris? I, my personal opinion is that makes her the favorite. Um, first of all, who knows what the Kenyan Selection Committee will do? Like, you know, like they could just go from a time list because this is not impressive, a 227 on a time list, right? Um, but we know the course profile in Paris. It looks tough. It looks, it's going to be a challenging course, a lot of elevation gain, um, in, you know, it's, it's summer, a summer race. I guess we haven't seen conditions just yet or her managed conditions super well. And then you could go back to last year's New York and be like, oh, well, maybe the heat was what cost her. Um, but I would, I mean, I would put her first on my team and then probably, I mean, Hassan, who knows? She's a she can, she's a magician. Like she just pulls shit out of nowhere and makes it work. So. You know, that's a great point though. Hassan obviously has got to be one of the favorites, but has yeah. she, I mean, I should know this. Has she run world cross country? That's, I, I think of her as like, like strictly has, a track but legend, like, but I definitely could be wrong, but I think of her as like the person who, if it's a flat, fast course, go for second because she is going to annihilate you in the final 400 yeah. meters. But perhaps with the course in Paris being hillier and stuff, maybe it does play more into the favors of an athlete with like a little bit more, I don't want to say range because Hassan <laughs> has more range than probably anyone. <laughs> um, but just the skill set of the tactical effort. And, and again, that Hassan has plenty of good tactical skills. So I don't know. I, I don't know why I was thinking O'Beary's got to be the favorite with a hilly course in Paris, winning Boston, winning New York, you know, being a world cross country champion, um, obviously being very fast on the track, a world champion on the track. I don't know how I forgot about Hassan. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for a cross country. I don't see much in cross country. Yeah, I don't. Honor. I mean, I would be, it hasn't resume, nothing but... recent anyway, because yeah. she's usually running it, some indoor races and things like that. So, I mean, we could see the clash of like, yeah, the ultimate 
I'm trying to think of what the word is when someone's really good at like cross country. I mean, that's like why I liked New York and Boston because I mm-hmm. like cross country, right? I'm yeah. not necessarily the speediest one, but I had strength over those types of elements and those challenges. And I feel like we could see the clash of like Hassan versus Obiri, like two kind of different athletes that are both expected yeah. to win. <laughs> Yeah, and that's like I mean that's their mentality, right? Like they've talked about Obiri after New York last year, where her her daughter is like, "Well, why did you get sixth? What happened? Like, how, <laughs> uh, like what were you thinking?" And she's like, "I felt so terrible." Um, but that's the expectation, right? And yeah, um, I mean Hassan's the same way. <laughs> um, yeah, I think those two. I think the course will matter. I'm trying to think of other athletes that um, who well who just set the world record in Berlin. Um, right. So Asefa, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just, I think the grittiness on these two courses that pull the pacers out, um, that to me is very valuable in a championship race. I think that I would put her hundred percent on the podium. Um, but you know, probably, probably the favorite at this point. Yeah. I think a day has to be in the conversation too. I feel like she's sure. learning the marathon at piece by piece. Like she learned she was out a little too hot in her debut. And then in this one, I think she's going to be kicking herself that she didn't push earlier. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what she does as well. But yeah, the air, I feel like women's marathons entry new territory for sure. I think the decision for G'day to do New York and like to come here on a course where she's not going to set the world record and not even worry about the time, like that's a great indicator that she's thinking about Paris and like, yeah, I mean, from a learning curve perspective, like Obiri went from six last year, one Boston, one New York. So you get on these courses a couple of times and it's like, oh yeah, I've, I've figured this out. This, this is how you have to change and um, if she's learning and absorbing, which I'm sure she is, you know, she could close the gap quite quickly as well. She's she's 25. I, like, that blows my mind. Isn't that weird? I'm like, that's not yes. right. I've been I've, hear, I've been hearing her name for forever. <laughs> right. She's 25. the one that runs so. like a deer. She prances. She's perfect. Like we all know her. How is she only 25? That's wild. If mm-hmm. you're an American and you're hoping to be on that Olympic team, when you look at the Olympics, it's me. Like, yeah, that's why I am an American. Um, What are you thinking about how that race would unfold and the different skill sets you need to have come Paris? I mean, if I'm on the Olympic team, I'm just like trying to finish as high as possible. (laughs) Um, Okay, no, Des in her prime. No, um, I think, you know, the I think Sissons and um, Emma Bates and D'Amato's and things like that. I, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's balancing like they got to get as fast as possible because these times are crazy and like i mean we heard obiri's in 211 shape so like get as close as possible to that um and then you know but you have to have more tools than that now right yeah see what it transfers to i don't i don't know do you no i'm just like if you make that olympic team you have to be able to run 218 but also you have to be able to close the last 8k as if you're on a track good luck yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Breaking hearts, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just like the 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 marathon is yeah. just changing so much. And so yeah, it it's is. wild for me to think about like if I was still competing and if I was competent, I was going to make that Olympic team, then what do I need to do to be ready come Paris, right? If, well, if my goal is just to go and run the smartest race possible, but if I'm like, no, I'm going to throw gonna... caution to the wind and try to get yeah. a medal, like I got to like I got to get on the track. I got to, and I have to do hard workouts, short tempoed workouts on the, on hills and stuff. Like I have to have a million tools in my Work chest. on my kick, which is crazy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like such my bullshit, last 400. Yeah. yeah. Like I got off the track for this exact reason. <laughs> right. Here we are. This <laughs> like, is so uncool. Yeah. What, what would you have done in today's race? I mean, I feel like you are known for your patience. Also like sit back, don't take the lead. I mean, would you have gotten antsy and just been like, I, I can't, we can't run another six minute? Or are you just like, nope, I'm a kicker. Let's go. You know, I think or, it depends I'll run on 449. In, yeah, <laughs> I think it depends on when in my career. I think, you know, that the first Boston I ran, that was the whole plan. Do not, I don't care how slow it is. You just wait until you turn onto Boylston. And in my gut with six miles to go, I was like, I can't, like, there's just too many people here still. There was still like 18 women or something ridiculous. So, yeah. but then in hindsight, 
I mean, I don't regret I did what I could on that day, but I, I also think as I got more confident in the marathon, I realized that it is the people, I mean, Edna Kibble got, got seventh today, but she won New York. I want to say, I mean, she's won everything, but I want to say she won New York in maybe the year I gave birth to Colt, maybe 2010. Yeah. And the thing that I will always remember is that her name was not even mentioned <laughs> Until like five miles ago, I was like, oh, and there's Edna Kiplagat of Kenya in there because she <laughs> just was isn't seen. And that's what we saw today. So I would hope that by my third or fourth marathon, I'd be confident enough to say, I don't need to prove to anyone I'm here. And this isn't a knock on Molly or Kellen because they had to hit, they were going for a time, right? Like they had something in mind that they wanted to achieve today. But I would hope that I'd have enough confidence to be like, I'm just going to sit. I'm going to sit. Yeah. Yep. And the longer it goes, the better it is because the sharper I'll be able to be at the end. But again, I think it, that takes so much confidence. And knowing that Obiri's coaches believe she's in 211 shape, like, yeah, I'd be confident too. I'm like, I'm in 211 <laughs> shape and I've been training up at Magnolia Road. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing you guys can do that's going to rattle me, right? Like I have all the tools in my chest right now. And that's that's a hard place to get to. And you know, you've trained for so many marathons. It isn't often that everything goes right, right? I mean, like that's very right. rare. Super so, rare, right? It's usually, yeah. Like usually, there's a hiccup or there's something. That, yeah, yeah, totally. So, I just feel like Obiria had the perfect performance. Like she, everything just like was locked in for her. So, yeah, I guess I'd be like, if I was still an athlete, I'd be like, I'm just gonna follow Helen Obiria and then. Hope. <laughs> To God, she trips in the last hundred so I can go by. <laughs> Hang on as long as possible. Yeah. yeah. It's tough. It's brutal. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, like, that that group was so big today that, you yes. know, I mean, every mile that goes by, you gain a little more confidence. Like, mm -hmm. still hanging on. Still hanging on. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, like, anyone heading into the Olympic trials should, should be looking at Kellen Taylor and Molly Huddle, but especially oh. Kellen Taylor. Like, she... I don't know. She gave birth in, I believe she gave birth in 2023. Like, I think so. In this calendar year. And <laughs> she is the kind of athlete that is just going to kill herself, right? Mm -hmm. Like, she is going to get everything she can out of herself. And I know she's probably going to be so frustrated with today. <laughs> and she's still around, I want to say 228 or 229. Like, it's not like, yeah. like she, right. she was only a couple minutes, or if even, out of the win, right? Right. And so, if I was like heading into the trials, I, I think that the women's trials are going to be crazy because there are, there are so many women who legitimately deserve to be on that team and who have had the performances that deserve to be on an Olympic team. And I think the men's trials are going to be just as exciting, but in a different mm -hmm. way where we don't have, we don't have 12 American men. You know what I mean? Like, knocking right. at the door, we gonna, yeah. but, but we have like 12 that are right together, ready to take that next leap. So the trials are going to be crazy on both sides, I think. Well, yeah. And they're going to be at noon. <laughs> yeah. Let's hit that for one, 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 one minute. Let's hit that. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> okay. This is like, like do you like I just poured gasoline on them and it's like <laughs> the fire is like is so big right now match. and I can't walk away. I can't walk away. It's gonna okay. be as hot as Orlando so in here. <laughs> <laughs> so we got all sorts of drama on this this past week, right? Like, so I actually heard from NBC from my boss that the time was being shifted and that we were gonna be, you know, live on Peacock and tape delayed on NBC. They were fine with it. And then, and then we, we find out, well, for, yeah, so first it was NBC's fault. Then we found out it's actually not NBC's fault. Then it was the USATF said they were willing to move it and, and yeah. NBC was willing to move it, but the local organizing committee wasn't ready to move it. And like there were, we were pitchforking them. We were ready to just take down their committee. Die. And then we find out that they're like, wait, what? No, we never said that. <laughs> So yeah. I've heard in the last like four days that the start time is six, eight, oh. 10, and noon. And noon. Yeah, I hadn't heard six. That's wild. Um, <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, it's bananas. They need What they need to do is just pick a time, finalize it, and stand by it because everyone wants to train and we need to know what to train for. Um, right. I will say, you know, 
big kudos to the Track Shack folks. Um, yes. I think it's the Hughes, Hughes family um, who is spending so much time and money and, um, you know, bid for this thing and is like, we want to showcase our city. We love the sport. And then they're like, everyone's just like, we hate you. It's like, no, 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 yeah. no. Pump the brakes on that. Like, they're doing an amazing thing. No, I, my understanding is no one makes money from hosting the trials. It's a huge loss. And it just takes so much, you know, time and dedication and real passion for the sport. And, um, you know, I, ho- I hope that's not lost after this. And you also got to wonder about who's going to be willing to bid after this kind of mess. Like, so there's a lot of things to think about. But I would just say hats off to Track Shack folks who are, who are just trying their best. I agree. I'm so glad you brought that up because the that group is super passionate about about the sport and so excited to host the best marathoners in America and so excited to treat them like rock stars and all these things. And so whatever went on in the last week, it made me really sad. Like people were taking, and I'm not calling anyone out, but people were taking me on social to go after them. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do that. Like if like don't, you know, I hate that phrase because people use it about me when I left Nike, but don't beat the hand that feeds you. But like, these are the people, don't bite the hand that feeds you. But like, they genuinely want to host this. They right. want to do it. They're so, they're not like, oh, well, we got stuck with the trials. They're like, no, Shoot. they want, yeah, they want yeah. this and they want to highlight it and they want to do what's right for the athletes and make them absolute stars and make America fall in love with them and show who they are. And so, this last week was a little rough when I saw that they they had to like defend themselves and I'm not I just feel like this situation has gotten so messy that it's like I I am worried about what's going to happen for the LA trials. Now granted the Olympics are going to be in LA so maybe it'll work out just cuz it's like oh you get to showcase who you're going to see on home soil um at the Olympics but yeah it's just gotten so messy and and ugly. And it makes mm-hmm. me sad. Like this is going to be an awesome meet. Whether the athletes start at noon, whether they start at 6 a.m., no matter what, like it's going to be awesome. And we have literally two of the most exciting Olympic trials races ahead that we've ever had in the United States. So if everybody could just take a deep breath <laughs> and remember that like this is for the love of the sport, for the athletes and for this hosting committee. Let's like everybody take a deep breath because it's going to be amazing no matter what time it starts. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think that's the thing to remember and remind ourselves and like, sometimes Josh and I get in fights and we pause and then I'm like, we, we really talk it out. I'm like, oh, we're, we're both trying to do the same thing. We both want the same end goal. It's just that right. we're going about it different ways. And then we figure it out, out and we're like, oh, okay. Like we're on the same team still. And that's the same thing with this. Like athletes want the best experience possible organizing committees want the best experience possible. Like, what does that look like? Maybe it's more fans, maybe it's better weather, whatever it is. But like the goal is the same, which is to have an awesome trials, have an awesome experience, pick the best team possible. Um, and, and everybody wants the same thing there. So it's just like, we got to figure out how everyone's trying to get there and then accommodate as many people as possible or figure out what the priority list is. And that's the sticky part, but the goal is still the same. Like, let's have an awesome trials. So I think we got to remember that every now and then. And to whoever actually is in charge, (laughs) make a decision on the time so we can fucking move on and get yeah. excited about the trials, right? Yeah. Either the athletes have to accept that it's going to be at noon or it's going to be at eight. And and so the athletes can prepare or whatever. I can just send like- my goddamn sauna back. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She doesn't need to be sitting in that thing every day if it's going to start at eight. So please let raisin. us know. <laughs> just make yeah. up your mind. God, it's like, Oh, I feel felt like I was defending at the beginning of like why the time was there. And yeah. I still think there are benefits to the time being there. But like if the athletes feel that strongly about it and everyone's willing to switch, then just switch. Switch it. Yeah. And just do it. It is November. <laughs> yeah, the trials are February 3rd. I cannot yeah. keep reading yeah. about this on Twitter. And every time I open up an interview and someone's being asked about it. So please yeah. just decide. I mean, it's literally three months away. Decide. Yeah. Right. Thanks. That's the biggest thing. Make a decision. Let people prepare. Let's promote the shit out of it. Yes. Um, yeah. Wow. New York okay, Marathon, should, man. <laughs> should we talk about the men's race? <laughs> um. Yeah. I, I have a crazy story to tell you, but you yes. tell me where you want me no, to No, no, no. Tell in. that story. I want to hear that story. Okay. Tell us we'll about the story. This, 
to lead into the men's race. Okay. Um, so we were on the broadcast today, 6 a.m. call time, the race, Amanda doing the wheelchairs had to start at eight. We're like, oh, this is kind of interesting. So we're meeting in the lobby. We're all there. Me, Galen, Amanda, they're like, hey, we're waiting for Lewis Johnson. He's, you know, going to be doing interviews at the finish line. We're like, okay, that's weird. So we're going there first. Um, whatever. Anyways, Lewis comes down. He's late. And we're like, this is, Lewis is never late. And he's like, I'm so sorry. Like I told them yesterday I was going to walk over, miscommunication. I'm so sorry to keep you guys waiting. He's very apologetic. No biggie, Lewis. Like we're just, we're going to go get to the park, drop off Lewis. And everyone gets out of the van. And I'm like, I think... I think we're taking this car to the start. Like, I think you need to be back in the car. Let me find out. So I asked the driver and he's like, I don't know. Um, so I text like the lady who's organizing stuff and she's like, uh, let me find out. I'm going to walk over. I'm like, you might want to run. It's getting late. Um, <laughs> so it's like we, we dink around for like 10 to 15 minutes and um, – someone gets over there and they're like, no, no, you guys have to be at the start. And I'm like, well, yes, we need to be at the start. We're going to be on the motos. So like, that's where we need to be. What car are we taking? I like, get back in the van. Um, and they're like, the bridge closes at 7 a.m. It's like 6.25, 6.30. Um, they're like, so you got to like haul. And um, they give the driver a credential, like a pass. And he's like, okay, I got this. And some point, someone said to him, do whatever it takes oh, to God. get to the start. So we're driving through Manhattan, and there's barricades everywhere. So Galen's getting out, like moving barricades, and then the guy's <laughs> driving up, and then they're moving them back, and we're like, oh, my God. And we finally, like, sort of get out of the barricaded part, and this guy's like, it's like Grand Theft Auto. He's, like, going 85 down, like, the Manhattan downtown there wasn't many people out but like disregard for stoplights like ripping through like traffic like we, like we're like rocking to the side in this car Are you car. guys like laughing or are you like oh my no, god No I was terrified <laughs> I was like me and Galen are in the back seat and I'm like white knuckling the like anything I could hold on to and he's looking at me like oh she's going to like she's going to lose her shit and we might die. And he's like kind of laughing it off. He's like, yeah, it's like, you're doing great, man. And I'm like, hey, bro, you need to like just chill because we need to actually make it there. Um, yeah. And so this is like the drive over. And we finally get like a police escort way too late after the tunnel. Um, and and he calls back in and he's there like, hey, where are you at? And he's like, we're, you know, we're almost on the bridge. We're the last people on the bridge. And they like closed it by, it's like when the boarding gate at the um, airport where they're like, okay, you're shut. No one else is coming on. Sit down. We're the last people through. And he's like, <laughs> I shouldn't even say this. He's like, yeah, I'm like, I'm white line certified. I was always going to get you there. Like, I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> 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 he was like he was so glazed over i'm pretty sure he was like out of his mind um i was like i can't believe we, that just happened and we all got out of the car and i was like oh kill me like i can't believe i have to go and like calm down from this now <laughs> that's uh, terrifying so it. yeah it was terrifying um but yeah we galen and i were laughing about it and he was like it was it was good until we were going 85 in the in the downtown manhattan and then i got a little terrified and then and then it was good again it was like all right well we've made it this oh is the God. worst part of it. it can only go up from here yeah uh, so welcome we to broadcasting there. galen <laughs> yeah right i was like holy shit this guy's insane but i i did want to get that off my chest because um after the broadcast i had a couple drinks so well that's where you know i'm at what's right crazy now <laughs> is why that another reason why that's stressful before even the car ride is like you knew you were running late and you knew where you needed to get to right mm -hmm. and you're like it's not like you can Stay show up it. two minutes before and they're going to be like, sure, come on in. Come up, come right. straight to the front of the Like you're just, that's it. You're yeah. out. Right. There's no motor car on, on the broadcast, right? So like you knew that you're trying to get everyone there. That like, so that part stressed me out when you were just telling that little part. <laughs> <laughs> I was like already stressed out. Like, oh my God, why are you guys taking Lulu to the finish line? Like you can just walk <laughs> there. <laughs> <You're both. laughs> right. And then you're waiting and trying and then you get in the car. That is super stressful. It was wild. It's like I've never been in the car with a drunk driver, but you're like you're totally a passenger 
Mm. And you're like, oh, like this is out of my hands right now. And this guy is, does not you know, like he cares. Like he, the mission is to get us there, but I don't think he cares like what happens to right <laughs> pedestrians, other cars, God. passengers. It was wild. Well, um, maybe yeah. before we talk about the men's race, we should, <laughs> in this vein, <laughs> talk about the men's 5K. Did you see that video? Yes. That's, <laughs> I mean, I think that's why I was like a little bit extra terrified. I was like just picturing us getting T boned by something. <laughs> okay. Which was exactly video, the 5K, right? It's insane. Yeah. It's like, I'm, it's been 24 hours. We can finally kind of chuckle about it. But I, that is the scariest video and something that has never entered my mind mm. in a road race in my life is that, oh, I might get hit by a city bus just barreling down here. Uh, do I think it's the city bus's fault? No. I mean, obviously there's some communication barriers there that like melted down and someone should be in, held accountable for it, but holy crap. So Oof. if you don't know what we're talking about, look it up. I put it on my Twitter or whatever the hell it's called now, but there's <laughs> the men are running the 5k, a big pack, the U S championship 5k on Saturday and a bus comes to the left of the field and almost takes out one of the, so they're being led by three motorcycles and almost takes out one of the motorcycles, the one all the way on the left. I mean, that was terrifying to see. Yeah. That, that bus was us. (laughs) Like I was on that bus (laughs) out of control. Yeah. That was, that was pretty wild. Um, just glad everyone was okay. If I had been in that race, I guarantee I would have stopped and just been like kicking the bus. Yeah. My son, <laughs> Colt was like, did that affect people in the race? And I'm like, it had 100%. to have affected them. Yeah. Like a court, like you, whether you see this bus coming, like, I'm sorry. Then you're running. You're like, did that just happen? What's going to happen at the like, next intersection? Right. Like, right? and now you're like, like, I mean, it's crazy. In all of my years of road running, I have never once of all the things I worry about, that are stupid, like (laughs) stepping in a pothole wrong or tripping or getting, you know, a fan reaching out and touching me because I like to run close to the um, side. Like of all of those things, getting hit by a vehicle was never in the mix. Yeah. That was crazy. That was scary. Okay. Well, you didn't get to see the men's race, but it was really good. I got to hear some of it. Yeah. Well, actually you probably heard just as much. Well, no, you heard just what I did. Because I was watching the women's live stream and then I was watching the broadcast. <laughs> some of, the, some of um, mine cut out, but yeah, okay. I mean, um, they had just a totally yeah. different race plan like break than the women. Early? It was breakaway and it was hot early on and it was charging after the course record, right? And I was just looking at the um, results because the last time that I saw someone with Tola, it was – Yimmer. And I was like, what? Jamal Yimmer. I was like, where did he f- end up finishing? Ninth. <laughs> wow. Which shows you just how fast they were running. I mean, Tolo looked unbelievable. 204.58 in New York. Hmm. Wow. That, and and alone for so much of it. Of course, it's crazy. Beating yep. Joffrey Mutai from 2011, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. 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 Jo- that, that year, Mutai was so good too. Yes. Like, what a year for him. Like, that record was like, top of the pyramid stuff. So, yeah. To see that. No more. It's crazy. It was crazy. And then some of the people that I thought like in the pre-race press conference that we thought might factor, didn't really factor. It was an interesting race. It was like a huge pack. And then all of a sudden it wasn't, you know what I mean? Like it was so quick. Mm-hmm. The decimation of it was like, oh, here are the women in this little tiny pack because their field is small. And here are the men with all their huge pack. And then all of a sudden it was like, the women's pack looked huge. Yeah. <laughs> Compared yeah, to the men. Tough. It was crazy. Yeah. Any thoughts? I mean, you didn't really get to see it at all, but. I, w- I was surprised by, I mean, I-, I think Cam Levins was a name that came up a lot and it was like, he's been great in Tokyo, the world championships, like just competed super late. And I thought that this course, given his high mileage and like how, you know, he's just a workhorse. I thought that it would suit him super well and we'd see him in there really late, but um, that time's pretty next level. So yeah, I was surprised. Yeah, I had by a lot that. of I had a lot of people reach out to me and ask me um about Cam Cam Levins after that video surfaced of him at the press conference saying that he you know did triples. <laughs> I want six <laughs> minute <like>, abs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like distance runners are the other way. Like I want quadruples. I want and I was like, abs. well. 
one of his skills is, I mean, he trained like that, not that much, but he trained a ton in college, right? And so yeah. one of his skill sets is that he can just take that mileage and take that strength, yeah. but sometimes- Being durable is a thing. Yeah, yeah. But maybe the pace was just a little too quick today, and I don't know. I mean, everyone will be breaking down his training now, but no one more than him, so. Yeah, that's fair. And, and then we had- Oh, go Chesarek ahead. Cheserick do. Oh, that's what I was going to say. We have Cheserick, who is like a, a million-time NCAA champion. I think it was like, yeah. like legitimately he won 12 or 13 NCAA titles. So he's like kind of taking this slow approach into the marathon and, you know, run a bunch of halves last year, really focusing on getting ready. And he ended up eighth in 211.07, which <laughs> isn't bad, but I think there was just so much interest in how he would do. But like a, your first marathon, it's really hard to judge anything off of, I think. Yeah. It's such, you learn yeah. so much. I mean, like at Helen O'Beary last year, she thought she could run away with it, ended up sixth. And now she's been untouchable her last two marathons. Like you learn so much from that first marathon. If you nail that first one, do you think that that's like a blessing or a curse? I mean, it's kind of cheesy words, but you know what I mean? Like there's the ignorance is bliss expectation expectations change um like what do you do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing um i don't know you know like i didn't like blow everybody out of the water in my first marathon but it went pretty freaking well yeah and i you know i finished third in new york and i i ran 225 and i suffered the last 3 miles pretty bad um and so when i finished i was like just thinking wow, I mean, if I could just like clean up those last few miles, like I could really be somebody. And maybe, you know, I the first time I hit the wall was in, so my first marathon was 2008. The second time I went to New York was 2014. So six years later, and granted, I had a child in there and everything, but that that's the first time I ever hit the wall in 2014. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like I would, I have never felt like it was almost like an auto yeah. body experience, right? Like you, that kind of happened to you, right? At your first marathon at the Olympic trials, second marathon. second marathon. Yeah. And yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, I can't even, I have no connection to my body. I'm not even totally sure where I am. Uh -huh. And I'm just like, <laughs> it was so awful. And I, and yeah. sometimes I'm like, Ooh, maybe that should have happened to me earlier. But honestly, I would have been fine if that had never happened. Yeah, and it, or if it happens to you earlier, you're like, I'm, I'm never doing that again. Yeah, like, right. Even, yeah, like, like there if is that an had ignorance first, is bliss for sure. If that had been my first marathon, I would have been like, and it's not for me. <laughs> Track. <laughs> I'll yeah, back see you later. Yeah. What about you? What do you think? Do you think it's a blessing or a curse to crush your first one? Hmm. I mean, I think like if you get to the end of the career and that's like the best one. I mean. It's good that you had a really like you've crushed one. Um, but I think that when you have a lot of success, like anytime you have a really good day or successful day, a, a lot of people forget to look for lessons because they're like, mm. well, it went great, right? Like when it goes wrong, you evaluate, you question, you critique, you dig in. When it goes really well, you're like, yeah, it was supposed to go like that. Um, yeah. So I think that not. If you're if you don't take the time to get the knowledge, and I don't know that you can actually get the amount the same amount of knowledge when it goes well, um, I think that's a missed opportunity. So I think that that you know can be bad, but some people just keep having success. <laughs> like yeah, oh um, well, you're just special. So. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if you if you're putting on your coaching hat. Uh -uh. Would you send an athlete out <laughs> aggressively in their first marathon? I mean, like my coach was like, at my first marathon, he was like, you can win this. Just go yeah. run with Paula, not kick her. I mean, like literally he was like, and and I don't, you know, it was fine. Actually, it was I had a great marathon. I have like, it, it was great. But sometimes I think, oh man, maybe I should have done something smaller first just to have the courage and the, and the like self-belief like, no, I can do this. Because like my longest run had been 23 miles. So mm -hmm. I'm like, we're talking about winning this thing. I've never even run 26 miles. You know what I mean? So there's something to be gained in just like accomplishing it and mm -hmm. then going back and looking at it and trying to rock it. But I don't know, put it on a coaching hat and you have an athlete who's super talented, really, really talented on the track, has risen well, has handled the training load. 
on race day, are you telling them, yeah, just go go out there and see if you can win this whole thing? Or are you like saying, okay, here's what I think we should do right now? And maybe it ends up with a win, but it's more conservative, accomplish the distance day. Gosh, dang, that's hard. I mean, it depends <laughs> on the athlete and their mentality. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I feel like there's something about like knowing – the work is there. Um, if you have the, if the athlete has the confidence, the trust, um, you know, I think it's super rare to have those moments where everything's gone right and you're ready to rip. So I would probably not, I mean, you're not sending someone on a suicide mission, like just get out over your head, whatever the leaders do, just follow. Um, but right. you kind of like, Hey, mix it up. And unless it gets to this point, which is way over your head, uh, I want you to, to be competing. So I think there would be some parameters around it, but I would say like, I, yeah, go and have a good day if you're ready to have a good day. Cause there's so few times you're ready for that. Yeah, that's true. That's my take. What would you do? Um, I just go for it probably tell him to yeah. go for it. <laughs> Swing away. Kid. As long as like, yeah. like I would, as you said, set some parameters because I think you need to know like what you're actually trained and ready to do. So if they start running 515s and the fastest you've trained at is 520s, that actually is a huge difference in a marathon. So I would want some sort of parameters. Like I wouldn't send them off with like without a watch, which is what I did. But I would also be like, if the training That's had gone well, I'd be like, you should be really confident, you know, and yeah. you, you've done the work to be here and you, but yeah, I agree with you. Some parameters because you can't – there's no way you can know what anyone else is capable of doing on that day. And you can really only do what you've prepared to do. So you mm-hmm. you are setting yourself up for failure if you're like, I'm going to go with it no matter what. You know, right. um, you need to know like, I'm going to go with it within this construct of what I've trained and, and I've shown day in, day out that I'm ready to do. But if someone's going to go run a world record, like, am I really going to go with that? No, I'm going to probably blow up and it's going to be a horrible experience. <laughs> yeah, then I'm never going to do it again. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hate it. I <laughs> uh, love it. Um, all right. Anything else in the marathon that we need to talk about, we should talk about, that you want to talk about? I don't think so. I just thought it was so cool to see a race on the women's side, just yeah. a race. Um, and it made me realize how much, since I call track races, how much we have just totally moved to this whole idea of focusing on time mm. all of the time. We have the American record and the world record and the pace and the championship record. And we we're always talking about time. And it was so cool to just see what running can be, which is just women or men just battling it out in the moment. And yeah. it really is going to go down for me as like one of the best races I've seen in a really, really, really long time. I love it. Okay. I'm going to use that as number one of our top five. Okay. That okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing us along here. Uh, yeah, good job. I know you. <laughs> okay, what's number two? <laughs> number two is this cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super tired, but I'm hanging in. Um, I'm fueled by coffee. This is not Linden by two, but it's it's Blue Bottle. I just made it before the show. It's delicious. Um, yeah, number two is brought to you by coffee. <laughs> I think number three is that you are here. <laughs> because we haven't even talked about your epic trip to Tokyo, which we're going to have to, obviously, on the next podcast. You've been all around the world, home for a hot second, in New York. I know you're traveling from New York for more work from here. And I'm just like impressed that – I thought you for sure you were going to be like, I can't do it. And I was going to be like, <laughs> no sh- kidding. I totally get it. And instead, you're here. And I just appreciate it so much. So number three for me is that you showed up on a day where I oh. fully expected you to be like, I can't do it. And I was going to be like, yeah, that's fair. I did think but about that. But um, no, we got out of there. It was a good um, anything on the schedule it means that there's a hard stop for something else, right? Like I got yeah. to have to go 100% because <laughs> there's this other thing on the schedule. Um, yeah. So, okay, for number three, I'm going to go back to the race. I'm going to say my number three is two different people. Don't don't divide it up. Then make that three and four. But Kellen Taylor and Futsum Zenio Salase, uh, top Americans today. I didn't see Futsum's race, but he's a gritty competitor, had a nice run at the 20K, a very nice fella, um, big fan of his. And then Kellen, you know, she – she raced great. She was so tough mm-hmm. and it was, I don't think it's a comeback for Kellen. I don't call, don't call it a comeback. Um, 
but it was fun to see her run well, execute, and then just another American in the mix for the trials, which is always exciting. Yeah. Okay. This is a two-parter, but it's it's Ooh, coming okay. off of that, which is that seeing Kellen back out there was awesome because she is so gritty. And one mm-hmm. thing I love about Kellen Taylor is that anytime she's out there, she is going to absolutely kill herself out there. Like she's like you're. She's going to get everything out of herself, and I think that makes her. Uh, like when she was my competitor, I was like, shit. But like as a fan now, I'm like, it's really cool to see her because yeah. she just like, you know, she's going to leave it all out there. And then it made me really excited for the trials in February because I just mm-hmm. think both on the men's and women's side, but again, I'm just going to hammer away that the women, the, it's just the talent and the dedication and the the want on the women's side is truly going to be incredible in Orlando. And I'm just so pumped that I get to watch it and talk about it. But it's really going to be, I think, the. I mean, I felt like 2012 was the best trials we had ever had. I felt like it was echoed in 2016. <laughs> Not necessarily way better, but still like same um, vibe-ish. Atlanta was the best trials I've ever witnessed. I was just a fan there. Um, and it's just cool. I didn't think that could be topped, but I think this it's going to be topped. Just, just yeah. the depth of American women right now. And, you know, such a cool storyline on the men's side too, a little bit more panicked, but a, a interesting <laughs> storyline. So it's going to be really, really good. And like, it just got me so excited today. I'm like, God, it's only three months away. I know. It's right good. around the corner. So good one. I'm going to go um, for number five with a beverage I don't have here. I have a, a cold beer. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a cup of coffee. <laughs> I have an Olipop water. <laughs> um, I, I have my massive oh my water bottle. <laughs> Drinking problem. Um, but I'm going to give it to a beverage that's not here and they don't particularly like, but high noon because um, I'm still fighting for that high noon start time in <laughs> Florida. I think it's going to be fun. Uh, I just love to be controversial and I'm going to end this with uh, some um, some gasoline on the fire. Okay. All uh, I can think go. of, all I can think of is that meme where Beyonce is walking away from the fire <laughs> and that is freaking you. You're like, bring it at noon. Boosh, Beyonce walking away. I love it. I don't even care anymore. I just think it's funny. I'm like, I'm going to stand to this stand by it because it just bothers other people. I'm just a troll. So, I love it. Epic trials. Epic. <laughs> Olympic trials brought to you by High Noon. <laughs> Amazing opportunity. Thank you for Amazing. the money. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to let you close it out, but um, Des is on roll today. <laughs> I have so many beverages. What a fun day. Um, what a fun podcast. The, the TCS activation out here at TCS New York Marathon has been fantastic. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of exciting things in the future with TCS. And hopefully nobody asked us. And um, guaranteed there will be more shows this year. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening.